of our uh, 2021 University of Michigan uh, Early Career Scientist Symposium. This, this year we've focused the symposium on natural history collections as drivers of innovation. My name is Brad Rufel and I'm a collections manager and assistant research scientist at the University of Michigan Herbarium. And I'll be helping monitor today's sessions or moderating today's sessions, I should say. Thank you to everyone that's attended for the over the course of the symposium and today and to all of our speakers and especially today's speaker. Um, so today's presentation will be by Pam Soltis and will be followed by a short Q&A and a panel at the end after the Q&A session. So please submit any questions you have for our speaker and the panel using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Please don't put your questions in the chat. And if, you, if needed, please notice the live transcript feature at the bottom of your screen um, if, if you need that. Um, finally, I'd like to make you all aware of a special call for manuscript proposals. Four of the major ecology journals for the British Ecological Society have announced a call for manuscript proposals for a joint special issue on the contributions and potential of natural history collections to address global change questions. This feature will comprise articles in Functional Ecology, Journal of Animal Ecology, Journal of Ecology, and Methods in Ecology and Evolution. For instructions on how to submit a manuscript proposal, please see our ECSS website. And we'll, I will also post a link in the chat now um, that links to that. So that has all the information on how you can submit a um, idea for a paper for those issues. So with that said, I'd like to introduce Hernan Lopez Fernandez. He's the Associate Professor and Curator of Fishes, as well as the Associate Chair for the Collections in our department. And he will give some closing remarks on the symposium and introduce our final speaker. Hernan? Thank you, Brad. Um, let me try to share my screen here. There you go. Does that work? So welcome everybody to our final day of, sadly, the final day of our 16th Early Career Scientist Symposium. Um, before I get into some brief closing remarks, I, I, I wanted to, to highlight something that I just learned from uh, Linda Garcia, our wonderful organizer and logistics director for the whole symposium. I understand that we have had over 560 registered participants from over 263 locations or institutions around the world. So this symposium has been truly uh, a really well attended global symposium. So thank you everyone who has taken the time and uh, to participate in the symposium. It's wonderful to have an audience like that. I also would like to thank our speakers. Without them, this would have been very different and they have managed to deliver some really fantastic event despite all the challenges that have been brought up by the fact that we had to change this to an online venue. And I really thank you all for sticking with us and making this such an exciting event. And finally, uh, a tip of the hat also for the organizing committee chaired by Dan Roboski and uh, along with Brad Rufel, Cody Thompson and our graduate students, Theresa Pagan, Taylor West and Ben Nicholas as well as Linda Garcia, who has been the powerhouse driving the logistics of the symposium, Gail Kuhnlein, who's done an incredible job at advertising and orchestrating the social media presence, and John Magahan, who created that beautiful artwork that's the face of the symposium. Um, now, briefly, this year's symposium obviously has focused on natural history collections as drivers of innovations in biological research. And I think it has really been, um, an occasion to see some wonderful examples of how natural history collections are providing us with a long series of new ways to study biodiversity that I think it's fair to say even a few years back we wouldn't have really imagined. And I think those modern uses of, of collections are one of the most salient attributes of natural history collections in general. Collect, uh, collectors, curators, collection managers grow collections and curate them uh, for 
a particular reason when they started with it, but, but years down the road, those same collections become the subject of very different uh, ways of studying them. And so their utility and, 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 and their importance for us, under, uh, for our understanding of biodiversity continues changing. And we have seen that in a really, really remarkably clear way throughout the symposium. And I think in, in that sense, perhaps the most unifying thing that we have seen emerge through the symposium is this concept of the extended specimen. Um, and of course, I'm a fish biologist, so this was the only opportunity I, I was going to have to squeeze some fishes into these talks. So I'm just going to make you suffer through it. But the whole idea is that traditionally we tend to think of collections as, 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 as this vast accumulations of specimens. In, in, in the case of wet collections like fishes, we think of these jars. But I think it's becoming increasingly clear that there's much more to collections than the specimens themselves. There's there's all this added value to those collections that come by virtue of new technology that allows us to look at uh, the very same specimens in different ways, like micro CT scanning and things like that. Our understanding of other aspects of biology that allow us to look at things like functional morphology and functional biology, the emergence of the genomic era and DNA sequencing, but also transcriptomes, microbiomes, any number of other ohms that I may not be thinking about, our ability to link ecology, parasites, habitat use, and, and other attributes of those organisms truly enrich what we can do with, with collections. And I think this symposium has been a wonderful example of, of how far that is going and, and how many new exciting directions that practice is taking. Um, so in some ways, just to paraphrase Rob Goralnik's opening keynote at the beginning, um, this extended specimens in, in collections are, are allowing us to build broader frameworks to understand phenotypic responses. And this is happening in a planet in which those phenotypic responses are constantly being changed due to our, our own impact on biodiversity. And those phenotypic responses can have a few, huge effect on our own lives beyond the biology that we can learn from the collections, as we have seen very starkly in, in this last very strange year of pandemic. Now, um, in his opening remarks, when, when we started the symposium, Dan Robosky pointed out uh, a couple of things that, that make all of this uh, not necessarily an easy task. On the one hand, we are faced with this sort of paradoxical situation in which we have this, what Dan called an eighth shortfall of our understanding of biodiversity, uh, expanding from Oracle's analysis, we proposed another seven, which is the fact that we need to learn more and more about biodiversity with, with unprecedented urgency at the same time that we are losing a lot of that biodiversity at an also unprecedented rate. And we also face another paradox um, which is the fact that at the same time that we are increasingly becoming consumers of biodiversity data and information, we often do not have the proper infrastructure or, uh, or support for the very sources of, of, of that biodiversity information, which in many cases are directly natural history collections and museums, large and small around the world. And the the continued efforts to, to collect and, and to continue growing and expanding the, the data that is present in those collections. So those two things are, are significant challenges, but nevertheless, I think this symposium has shown us how important it is to overcome those challenges and that we actually have a pretty strong um, prospect of succeeding in, 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 in continuing to support the generation of that data. We have seen the symposium shown us there's a great momentum and progress in our understanding of biodiversity and in embracing this extended specimen view of collections that empowers us to understand biodiversity way beyond the, the objects that form those collections. Um, also, these early career scientists that we have been listening to through the symposium serve as an, as an example and an inspiration of how to leverage both the old and the new collections to look at questions we might never have thought of before and that we really need to answer very urgently um, beyond our academic understanding of ecology and evolution for which collections are indisputably essential we also need, need to understand biodiversity at different levels and at global scales 
for very practical reasons, to stop the next pandemic, to understand how climate change is affecting biodiversity or to mitigate its impacts, to develop more sustainable ways of living and to learn how to better coexist with biodiversity and try to reduce this rate of disappearance that, that is so concerning. So these scientists have been living examples of how collections and their uses evolve and how they can help us in all these challenges. And perhaps more importantly, they're also serving as role models for the new generations of biodiversity researchers that have been uh, attending the symposium and that are studying their, their work. And uh, hopefully they will make it grow as a, as a new generation of biodiversity scientists with a better understanding of how collections are fundamental tool in understanding biodiversity and, and protecting it, frankly. So I think that we should owe them a big thank you for that role model uh, uh, role that they have and for also the excellent direct advice that they have been providing through the through various discussions at the end of their talks throughout the symposium. So I, for one, I'm very optimistic and I really can't wait to see where this new approaches to, to using natural history collections are going to take us and to see which newer approaches are going to emerge over the next few years and decades. Um, so at risk of talking way too much, I'm going to now stop talking and I'm going to introduce you to our final keynote speaker of the symposium, Dr. Pam Soltis who is a distinguished, distinguished professor and curator of the Florida Museum of Natural History at the University of Florida. Um, and beyond titles and degrees, I, I'm really honored to introduce Pam because she has been a constant driver of innovations in the use of museums and natural history collections, as well as a tireless advocate for their importance in research and education and outreach. So I really, think it, it, it would be wonderful if anybody could go and check her website and, and see all the different dimensions of, of, of her work and, and how natural history collections are directly linked to that. She's a world-renowned botanist with a very broad set of interest in, re in and research subjects that span anything from angiosperm phylogeny to speciation to polyploidy to the use of digitized natural history collections and biodiversity research in, in many different ways. Her team's contributions to angiosperm phylogenetics and the genomics of speciation and diversification are so many that I'm not even going to try to summarize them. But she's also been a pioneer in the use of digitized data for her barrier, from her area for studying plant diversity and has been instrumental in recent efforts to build understanding and making the tree of life accessible to the general public, which is a really uh, fundamental activity to do from the museum's perspective. So fittingly, I think it's uh, really important to have Pam as our closing speaker for our symposium. And I'm going to now leave them with her for her presentation of the integrative, re integrative research using natural history collections and examples from her area. Thanks very much, Hernan, and thanks to Brad, and thank you to the entire committee for this uh, great opportunity to share some of our work with all of you and with the folks who are turning, tuning in from around the world. Of course, it would have been really awesome to have gotten together in person back on March 13th of 2020, but I think you've all done a, a wonderful job of um, extending the symposium that you had planned before to reach even broader audiences, and I really congratulate you on that. Okay, so, all right. So um, I think that Hernan did an excellent job of introducing the concept of the extended specimen, which is really something that is at the core of a lot of what I'll be discussing today. Back when IDIG Bio got started about 10 years ago, one of the things we were initially interested in was considering ways to link natural history collection data to other sorts of data. And um, little did we know that um, so many different fields would be making their data available at the same time as the natural history data were becoming available and that there would be so many opportunities to start linking together this data from these very different resources, um, really providing the, 
the context and the opportunity for the um, extended specimen concept to be developed and to some extent already starting to be implemented. Now, often when I give presentations on natural history collections, I need to spend a lot of time explaining what collections are and really touting their value. And of course, for this symposium and this audience, um, that's not necessary at all. But I would like to emphasize here with a few introductory slides how massive the data are that we can obtain from natural history collections. Now, of course, we still don't really know how many specimens there are either in the US collections or worldwide, but there are estimates that in the US we have somewhere between one and two billion specimens, and that globally there may be between three and four billion natural history collection specimens. And in the US, we're now starting to get a better handle on how many natural history collections there actually are. Globally, that remains sort of a mystery, um, but through efforts at GBIF and elsewhere, um, new registries and, um, and directories of these collections are becoming available. And so just as a global community, we're starting to become more and more connected. Now, of course, our collections represent the foundation of systematics and taxonomy, but we also know that these collections are used in so many other ways. And this just lists a few of them from genetics, genomics, chemistry, studies of species interactions, phenology, biogeography, and all of the sorts of things that you've been hearing about throughout the symposium. Now, currently within IDIG-BIO, which is the US National Center for Digitization of Biodiversity Collections, there are over 128 million specimen records. Each of these records corresponding in some cases to a specimen, in some cases to a jar of fishes, for example, um, corresponding to uh, many different types of collection objects. In addition, there are nearly 41 million media records, and these represent in large part herbarium, individual herbarium specimen sheets, as well as in some cases vocalizations and in some cases videos. But the vast majority of those media records are actually herbarium specimen images. Now, IDIG Bio is just one data aggregator. There are many other data aggregators that are focused on either specific taxonomic groups such as VertNet, they may be national um, aggregators such as the NSII or Canadensis or the Atlas of Living Australia or Species Link from Brazil, or they may be regional such as RainBio. And just about all of these aggregators feed into GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, which shares information on a global basis. Um, and I just like to point out the vast amount of plant data available through the world's herbaria, 3,400 or so herbaria with about 400 million specimens. So this is amazing if one is a botanist. Now within IDIG Bio itself, about 48% of the specimen records are, um, are for plants. So we have somewhere around 60 some million specimen records. And of the media records, 85% are um, plant herbarium specimen images. So somewhere around 35 or more million um, images of herbarium specimen sheets. Now, as I mentioned, um, one of the things that's been driving IDIG Bio since before it was even approved as IDIG Bio um, it has been the opportunity for linking together heterogeneous data. So linking together the um, specimen records and the information that they carry along with information from ecology, genetics, functional traits, and many other sorts of um, resources. And I'd just like to echo one other point that um, Ernan made early on, and that is the unanticipated use uh, for many of our collections. So certainly when many of our specimens were collected, in some cases centuries ago, and there was absolutely no idea um, the ways that those specimens would be used. And today we know that these specimens can help us understand many, many aspects of fundamental biology. 
But in addition, they can also help us address societal challenges, including such things as studying the effects of global change on biodiversity, where we can use specimens to track the loss of biodiversity, track the movement of invasive species, document changes in land use, and um, study the loss of ecosystem services. These specimens have also been used and continue to be used in studies related to food security, and they play um, an important role um, that could play an even more important role in um, studies of emerging pathogens and other factors related to human health. So in, in all of these cases, these specimens were collected for one purpose, but used for many others. And I think this is something we need to keep mindful of um, because it really relates to the overall value of these collections. And these are points that are made in the re recent National Academy's um, consensus study report on biological collections. And if you haven't seen this, um, I would just direct your attention to the National Academy's website and um, you can download the report uh, for free. Now today I'd like to present just a, a few examples from our work um, that demonstrate how we can use herbarium specimen records and images in ways that until five to 10 years ago um, were not really possible. And some of these um, are, are much more recent sorts of developments than others. So the first example that I'll present has to do with Florida plant diversity and responses to climate change. The second example extends that work to an analysis of phylogenetic diversity and conservation. And then I'll turn to machine learning and the role of machine learning techniques in the study of plant phenology and also other sorts of, um, of issues and processes. And then I'll turn away from the digitized specimens and consider how we can actually use our physical herbarium specimens um, on a large scale. And then finally, I'll just close with a few comments about how um, AI, artificial intelligence, can be used in um, or potentially for collections management and improvement of data quality of our digitized collections. So um, I'd like to start out with this um, study of Florida plant diversity. This um, was, represents in part um, a paper published by um, Julie Allen and a huge team, um, including Rob Grounick, who uh, was your first speaker. And um, this is uh, started out as some exploratory uses of herbarium, digitized herbarium data um, back, um, you know, nearly probably eight or more years ago. And um, we've used this as a pilot to help us uh, develop new methods and new approaches for um, how to use some of these uh, natural history collection data. So Florida uh, has multiple ecoregions, three large ones, the Southeastern Plain, the Southern Coastal Plain, and the Southern Florida Coastal Plain. And those may all sound like the same thing to many of you, but they actually represent very different areas with very different vegetation and different environmental contexts. Um, you may also think that Florida um, lacks topography. I'll tell you that's not exactly true. Um, we have uh, just a very small change in elevation can represent um, an extreme difference in the type of uh, vegetation that can occur in a region. And then therefore the, others, um, the rest of the biota that's supported by that vegetation. So there are about 4,300 native and naturalized vascular plant species across these three ecoregions of Florida. So we were interested in um, exploring how well these herbarium specimen data could be used to, first of all, model the um, distributions of species and then um, establish what the potential impacts of climate change might be on these species. So we did some you know, typical ecological niche modeling um, using environmental data um, from WorldClim, um, the BioClim variables, and then Maxent software. Um, we started out with um, about 1,500 plant species for which there were enough um, specimen records. Uh, we're actually redoing this, and we will have enough specimen records to do pretty close to um, all of the um, species that now occur in Florida. 
And this um, initial work was led by Charlotte Germain Aubrey, who was a postdoc in the lab at the time. So I'll give you just a few examples of this work um, with, from species that represent different outcomes. So the first of these is the flat spike sedge. This is a relative of the grasses. And when we uh, reconstruct the uh, ecolo or construct the ecological niche and project that onto geography, we see that the greatest probability of occurrence is in um, southeastern Florida, the areas that are shown here with the um, warm colors. And when we project where those habitat characteristics will be in 2050, we um, can then plot out uh, where the probability of occurrence would be. And here we see that there are no warm colors. And that suggests that in fact, there will, um, there's a high probability of there not being suitable habitat for this species just in the next 30 or so years. Now, in contrast, we have the situation of the scrub plum. This is um, a species that is native to the Lake Wales Ridge that runs through central Florida. This is our, our high elevation backbone of the state. It's extremely hot and dry and um, its current distribution you can see um, there through the, or projection of its current distribution you can see there in the center. Now, as conditions will get hotter and drier over the next few decades, the possible suitable habitat is likely to expand. And so the probability of occurrence of the scrub plum is, will be much more, or the probability is much greater than um, currently. And you can see that through the extended areas of red, orange, and yellow throughout the state. So I think you can see from these two examples that in some cases, um, species that currently maybe have um, narrow distributions will um, perhaps not find any suitable habitat just in the next few decades, whereas others may have much more extensive suitable habitat. The challenge, of course, will be whether or not they will be able to um, move to those new locations through movement of, um, of seed and then establishment in new locations. So we did those same experiments for about 1500 plant species. And then um, we compiled the results in this um, heat map. The green represents areas of high species diversity the orange and brown low species diversity. And this is for the present. And you can see that most of the, um, of the species diversity occurs um, through this part of um, West Central Florida and then also in a panhandle. But what about in the future? So this map shows um, the, a change in um, projected species diversity. So green represents here a gain of species diversity and tan a loss of species diversity. So what we see here is that this area that um, at, at the present it has the highest species diversity will lose species uh, and with suitable habitat being found to the north and to the south. So um, this suggests that um, there are likely to be many, in some cases, dramatic and drastic changes to the plant diversity of a number of regions across Florida. And this, of course, suggests that it's not too soon to be thinking about conservation. But when we think about conservation, we have a number of questions that we need to address. So what do we protect? There are, of course, those very rare iconic species that we know we want to protect. Um, there are also areas that have a, an abundance of rare species, and perhaps those are areas that should receive prioritization. But, and then there are areas that just have high species richness, regardless of whether the species are rare or not. So there are a number of considerations that go into um, identifying regions and species for conservation. But maybe there are some other things that we can bring to the table. For example, phylogenetic diversity. And here we're interested in how much of the tree of life is present in a specific geographic area. Now, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this concept, but just in case some of our audience is not, we can think of phylogenetic diversity in the following way. 
So let's say there's an area that has eight species of oaks in it. And those oaks are different species. Oak specialists all recognize them as different species, but still they're all oaks. And then there's another area that has of perhaps equal size, but it has much greater species diversity. It has three oaks, but it also has a water lily. It has a number of other species there. So unless you're an oak specialist, you're probably going to be more interested in the species diversity that's present in the bottom part of that um, diagram. And this would represent a larger part of the tree of life than that sliver of oak diversity in the top. So if we could measure phylogenetic diversity of relative areas, we might be able to use the concept of phylogenetic diversity to help us prioritize regions for conservation. So how would we go about doing that? Well, we could um, divide a region such as Florida into a number of pixels and at each pixel obtain a species list. And we could obtain that species list by seeing what um, herbarium specimens, in this case for plants, are present in that area. So we could go to our data aggregators and obtain um, spe the species records for all of the species in a given area. We can then combine that information with a phylogeny. And if we have a phylogeny for the region, we can then map out the amount of branches, the br total branch length that would be covered by the species in that a particular area. So here we have one little spot up here in the Florida Panhandle. We can get a species list for that um, pixel and then we can um, plot those species in red onto the phylogenetic tree for the plants, let's say of all of Florida. And this um, would give us an estimate of the branch lengths or a measure of phylogenetic diversity for that pixel. And we could do the same thing for every pixel across the state and develop a heat map of phylogenetic diversity across the area. So what do we need? We need a phylogeny. So we have um, a phylogeny currently for about 3,600 of the 4,300 um, species of vascular plants. And we're in the process of updating this with um, several hundred more um, species so that we will be very close to that total number of species for Florida. We um, then need the uh, locality information so that we can obtain the species list for each pixel. And of course we can use IDIG bio and various other aggregators such as GBIF and local, um, rep local resources as well. And when we do that, we can develop um, a heat map that looks like this, that shows us um, in the dark colors where the highest phylogenetic diversity is. We can see some of those in the central Florida peninsula, as well as a few spots in the panhandle and then in the light green areas that um, have very low phylogenetic diversity. So then we can start making comparisons such as where does, is this phylogenetic diversity distributed relative to the human population or relative to land use or relative to many other sorts of um, information. And so here we can see that uh, we'll just take a look at some of these areas of high phylogenetic diversity, this one around Orlando, this one in the Tampa Bay region, another area of high phylogenetic diversity in Southeast Florida and the Miami region. So unfortunately, several of these high phylogenetic diversity regions correspond to high population density and therefore not likely candidates for future um, conservation. But we also see that there are some areas in green here that have high phylogenetic diversity, but low population density and might include some areas that would be uh, valuable for uh, conservation. So uh, we decided to look at our current conservation areas and ask how well they actually capture plant phylogenetic diversity across the state. So here on the large map, the green blotches represent conservation areas of various types. And then we have again, our map of phylogenetic diversity. And we see here um, just a few of the areas that are preserved. And, and shown in the red circles, and they have low phylogenetic diversity. They may have other very important reasons for being conservation areas, such as high abundance of rare species, such as um, in this area around Apalachicola, 
um, they may represent part of the Everglades, again, an iconic region, so uh, representing an important region for conservation. But there may be some other areas that are good candidates for conservation as well that aren't currently under consideration. And so these regions in turquoise represent areas that are not mostly preserved, but that have high areas of phylogenetic diversity and incidentally, mostly low population density. So these could represent new areas for um, conservation consideration. Now, this work that I've been describing falls sort of broadly in the field called spatial phylogenetics. And uh, we're, we have a number of collaborative projects ongoing with, with um, many others, including um, Stephen Smith at Michigan, um, as well as others who, um, are, and these projects are focusing on such topics as North American seed plants and their phylogenetic diversity across this large spatial scale. Um, another project that um, was recently published, um, Maria Cortez is uh, one of our graduate students and she was the first author on this. She's interested in plant diversity in the Campos Upestres of Brazil. And um, in this paper, uh, we examined how well, or how well we were able to um, match up ages and distributions of regions referred to as Ockville's old climatically buffered infertile landscapes. And um, so these are just a couple of other examples of spatial phylogenetic work that ha have been conducted recently in our lab. So at this point, I'd like to um, move on to the um, application of machine learning to studies in, in plant diversity, um, focusing mostly on plant phenology, but with a few other examples as well. Now, wouldn't it be great if we could begin to harvest harness the power of artificial intelligence, that same, the same um, opportunities that are leading to the development of self-driving cars and that do that annoying autocorrect on your phone. Um, but if we could use some of this, some of these approaches to address questions in biodiversity, we could perhaps make better use out of these many, many data points that um, continue to be made available to us through digitization efforts. Well, of course, this is in fact happening. Um, machine learning was applied to plant identification um, as long ago as five years ago, actually more when you consider when they actually probably did the work prior to the publication of this paper in 2016. This is a study from Suzanne Renner's lab at the University of Munich, where uh, they were interested in testing the ability of machine learning algorithms to classify German trees to species. And in fact, they were able to do this with 85% accuracy based really on just a couple of characteristics, leaf shape and venation. Now for taxonomists, 85% accuracy might be appalling, but for many users, 85% accuracy would be awesome because it might help get the identification to the family or the genus or um, some other area, you know, um, honed in area that would then make it much easier to figure out um, ultimately the actual species ID. And maybe for some applications, it doesn't matter even what the exact species is. So this was um, one of the first applications of using machine learning and it um, was quite impressive. But it was followed up the following year by another study where um, the authors investigated more than 1200 species using 250,000 images from IDIG bio. And they were able to um, identify the species with 90% accuracy. So these early studies really um, started people thinking more and more about how the approaches could be used for a number of different sorts of questions. And one of the questions that are what started receiving the most attention was the study of phenology. So phenology refers to the key seasonal changes in plants and animals from year to year. And this includes for plants um, flowering, um, it also includes for other organisms, things like the emergence of insects, migration of birds, and together these changes in phenology over time are being used as markers of climate change. So um, in plants, we see um, scoring of bud burst, 
of flowering and fruiting and comparisons of those with um, um, when those events ha happened over long periods of time. Now, of course, it's important to consider the effects of any change in phenology in one group of organism on the, um, and the impacts on other groups. So for example, changes in plant phenology may not compare well with um, changes in insect emergence or um, the availability of pollinators. Um, there may be changes in bird nesting and migration, and some of these changes may end up resulting in phenological um, asynchrony. So from the perspective of plant phenology, within the US, there's the National Phenology Network, which is a collaboration of scientists and citizen scientists who record the dates of first flower and um, bud burst and fruiting and so on across the um, continental US. And so this is a graph from a couple of weeks ago, and it shows um, through these differences in color um, changes in, or the first, um, first flowering time. So the warmer colors here in the South, lighter colors um, farther North, and then all of this gray area where things um, had not yet begun flowering. The things at least that are targeted by this um, network. Now, um, through the data that the National Phenology Network has, it's possible to compare any year with normal in terms of the, um, in this case, first flower where um, in this case, the red represents areas that are ahead of the average and blue areas that are behind the average. So um, this is an, a, an impressive resource and it really helps um, in terms of monitoring changes in phenology, but it's limited to the last 40 years and it's, it's limited to a certain set, set of target species. And in fact, many of those species are those that can be actually identified through um, satellite imagery as well. So what if it were actually possible to get a much longer view of changes in phenology and for many more species? Well, of course that's possible when we refer to our herbarium specimens. Um, again, some of these specimens in North America were collected several centuries ago. And we have um, many, many thousands of species at our disposal for studying phenological change. And some, in some cases, the phenological data may come from the images themselves where we can score a specimen for having um, the presence of fruits or flowers, or the phenological data may actually come from the label information, the actual description of the specimen, where a specimen might be described as being in full flower or full fruit. So, um, of course, people have been uh, using this approach, and Brad is one of them, uh, who was one of the early um, people to apply this approach with herbarium specimens. But of course, if one is limited to scoring them by hand, um, it's harder to look at as many specimens over as much time or, or over a much longer time frame. And so if we could use machine learning, we could certainly um, increase the number of specimens, the time scale and the geographic range. So um, this represents um, a pilot study that we did a few years ago uh, where we were interested in how well we could actually score fertility from herbarium specimens. And this was done across um, several herbaria with the specimens actually um, separated into the data from those separate herbaria. And each line represents a, um, a separate herbarium. But we could um, actually um, identify fertile specimens uh, with 96% accuracy. Now, when it came to being able to distinguish between flowering and fruiting, the accuracy was much lower. And of course, this makes a lot of sense because sometimes the flowers are very small, the fruits are very small, and it's impossible um, unless one is perhaps a specialist to actually tell the difference there um, without a lot of additional work. But if one is simply interested in fertility, this, um, the application of this algorithm worked quite well. Now, um, the application of segmentation masks may um, also be a valuable way of um, working with phenological data. 
Um, but there are also challenges here. So the figure on the left is a herbarium specimen of a California poppy. Here, each flower is on its own stem and, um, it's, and the flowers are large. So it's very easy to apply the segmentation mask to um, each individual flower. And this means that it's easier than to train the algorithm and for the algorithm to be successful at scoring other specimens. Um, the figure in the middle is a maple, and this has a lot of specimen or a lot of fruits. Each of those fruits um, can be um, mapped or segmented, and this provides opportunities for um, perhaps looking at, at fruiting. But a lot of those fruits are overlapping with each other. And so it, um, the actual um, outline, the, the um, appearance of each of those uh, segmentation units is um, perhaps a little bit more difficult. And the flowers are very small and um, very difficult to um, segment away from the rest of the specimen. And then on the right, we have an orchid that has, um, unlike the showy orchids that we may think of in many cases, um, has very small flowers and very tight clusters, and it's virtually impossible to recognize any individual um, structure there as something that could uh, receive a segmentation mask. Of course, one possibility would be to uh, mask the entire inflorescence in that case and use that as the um, measure of fertility. So even though these methods are starting to get better and better, um, it, there are still a number of challenges that the plants themselves present. So last summer, um, a special issue of applications in plant sciences uh, was published and um, with the emphasis on machine learning and plant biology. And there were, it's a double special issue. And the first one, the June issue, has um, all um, studies that are based on herbarium specimen images. And um, these were fascinating papers. And I just, I would um, direct your attention to those papers. But I do want to just um, highlight a couple of them. The first one of these is from Michigan's own Will Weaver et al. Um, and this reports the development of Leaf Machine, which uses machine learning to automate leaf trait extraction from digitized herbarium specimens. So um, that looks like a, a really promising approach for studying leaf um, morphology and leaf traits and for scoring traits such as um, the margins and leaf area. Um, because that all goes directly into a CSV table um, as these specimens are processed. The second example is one from Alex White, and I'm not sure what he talked about when he was in the symposium, but this is uh, one of those papers. And um, in this paper, he, was, he and his colleagues were interested in being able to um, develop masks for the um, um, for studying the complex morphology of ferns and um, their leaves. And this uh, showed a successful application of this approach to studying um, fern and lycophyte vegetative morphology. And then this one, which I think is fascinating, is a study by Emily Meineke and some of her collaborators on um, uh, using herbarium specimen images to study patterns of herbivory. And they developed uh, machine learning approaches that could um, distinguish um, regions of herbivory from regions of non-herbivory. And this is true um, for both herbivory that occurred in the interior of the leaf as well as um, herbivory along the margins. So I think that there's tremendous um, potential for further application of machine learning approaches to this vast resource we have of herbarium specimen images. Now, the last um, main example that I'd like to share has to do with actually using the physical herbarium specimens themselves rather than um, digital representations of parts of those specimens. And in this study, um, we applied evolutionary biological um, principles toward the purpose of crop engineering. And the, the name of the project is actually Phylogenomic Discovery and Engineering of Nitrogen Fixation. And um, there's more information about this project at nitfix.org. So this is uh, a large collaboration among um, institutions. Matthias Kirst from our forestry unit at the University of Florida is the lead PI. And um, he's interested in 
genetic engineering of poplar trees as a bioenergy crop um, with one goal of being reducing the amount of nitrogenous fertilizer that is used to um, grow these trees. Now, this is um, a goal that a lot of, um, of scientists in agriculture are interested in as well, because so much of agriculture depends on uh, nitrogenous fertilizer. Nitrogenous fertilizer is extremely expensive to produce, both in terms of, of dollars, um, but also in terms of the cost to the environment, <clears throat> because it, um, it produces a large, um, uh, has a large carbon footprint. In addition, um, that fertilizer, once applied to an agricultural area, ends up um, having impacts far beyond the agricultural area in terms of its runoff patterns. And so for many reasons, it would be wonderful to be able to reduce that nitrogenous fertilizer as we also um, need to improve and increase um, food production. So through this study, um, we are interested in understanding more about the symbiosis between uh, plants and the nitrogen fixing bacteria that inhabit root nodules um, of many of these species. And you can see these root nodules here in the center figure. So there are three main parts to this project. The first is um, discovering the genetic toolkit of these nodular symbioses. The second part is um, using that information to understand the genetic and functional aspects a little bit better, and then ultimately engineering that into um, crops such as uh, poplar. So um, as a little bit of background, um, we know that um, a large number of plant angiosperm species have symbiosis with symbioses with nitrogen fixing bacteria in their, their roots. And this is most commonly um, seen in the bean or legume family, but it's also found in a number of other families. But all of those angiosperms that have the symbiosis occur in a single clade of angiosperms. And you can see that clade marked out over here in this red trapezoid. So they are out of the nearly 400,000 species of angiosperms. Um, this clade of about 31,000 species actually has um, all of those species that have this nodular nitrogen fixing symbiosis. So um, that means that you know, something happened in the origin of that clade or near the origin of that clade that perhaps led to the ability of this uh, symbiosis to evolve. But, but it's not really clear what those patterns are. And until we actually understand how these symbioses uh, originated, then it's impossible to understand and really identify those um, particular um, aspects of the genome that are responsible for nodulation. So our part of this project is to identify cases of loss and gains of symbiosis, and then to identify sister pairs that can be used for genetic and genomic analysis. So in order to be able to sample this clade of 31,000 species, we decided that the only way to have um, good sampling was to actually use data from herbarium specimens. And so we sampled tissue from 15,000 species all from herbarium specimens. And here you can see the, um, the logos of those um, collections that provided us with the majority of these samples. And I'll just uh, make a special call out to the New York Botanical Garden and the Missouri Botanical Garden, which provided most of the samples. So we sampled small amounts of tissue. And then um, at at these herbaria and then um, eventually isolated DNA from them, used a target capture approach to um, generate sequence data, and we're now at the point of doing the analyses. But I'd like to um, point out the amazing work that um, two people in particular have contributed to this project. First of all, Heather Rose Cates, who's currently a postdoc on this project, and Ryan Folk, who was a postdoc but um, now is on the faculty at Mississippi State University. So we've um, recently um, published um, a description of the workflow that we used. This was published in Applications in Plant um, Sciences earlier this year. And I'll just note that nothing throughout this entire process was written down or typed or anything. 
everything was done using a combination of barcodes and scanners. And um, that um, certainly enabled us to be able to do the sampling and all of the lab work and the analysis that we've done to this point in the span of just a little bit over three years. Oops. So uh, we reconstructed the uh, phylogeny, and by we, I mean Heather Rose, and um, we're in the process now of um, exploring some um, alternative hypotheses about the origin and distribution of the nodular, um, of nodulation across this clade. So this is a phylogeny of these 15,000 species and um, it's showing the reconstruction of ancestral nodulation in this clade. And um, in gray are the non-nodulating species and blue are the nodulating or symbiotic species. And these come from primarily the, the legumes as well as the, um, the rose family, the um, squash and pumpkin family, and then also the um, beech and oak family. So um, as you can see, the common ancestor here is um, gray, representing a lack of nodulation. And so we see that there are multiple independent origins coupled with some losses, but not a lot of losses um, um, in terms of the evolutionary pattern um, of this trait. Now this is, um, these stu studies are still in their early stages, but, um, but all of the analyses we've conducted so far suggest something um, very similar to this overall pattern. So um, I'll just, I'd just like to uh, reemphasize the value of um, herbarium specimens and other museum specimens for molecular analysis as well. But of course, we need to be really careful about the use of those specimens because this does uh, involve dis destructive sampling. But it also represents just another outstanding example of how over time the possible uses of these um, specimens changes dramatically. So I'd like to end with just a few comments about um, artificial intelligence and collections management. And I think that there's a lot of room for development and growth in this area. Um, certainly um, one of the, the things that's happened within the herbarium community over the last several years is an abundance of generation of images of specimens and with the downstream goal of eventually transcribing the labels and capturing the label information um, separately. So there may be a very um, minimal spell, um, specimen record associated with, Im with each image at this point in time, but with many more, with much more information coming from the actual record that's not yet incorporated into the um, digitized record. So transcription events could definitely um, benefit from some sort of artificial intelligence. Likewise, data quality is an issue that we're all struggling with. Certainly when digitized specimen records were first being made available, a lot of people were concerned about putting their data out there because, oh, what if this is misidentified? What if there's, you know, what if there's a problem with this identification? And what if there's a problem with this geo reference? What if my GPS coordinates are off? Well, of course, the only way really to find out if there are errors is to make the data available and have the community contribute to um, annotation and improvement in data quality. Now, the aggregators, the, um, particularly the larger aggregators, are working on ways to flag um, data um, errors or possible data errors so that users can beware um, prior to using some of those records. But um, in addition to uh, flagging those um, potential errors, some of the aggregators are also interested in trying to develop uh, ways to um, make possible corrections. Now, of course, that also requires a lot of input from the community so that things aren't corrected to something that is in fact incorrect. But there may be ways to um, facilitate um, issues with regard to tax on names for sure using AI. And perhaps it would be interesting to think about even applications of AI to um, reconciliation of taxonomic concepts, although that would obviously be a lot more challenging. Certainly issues with regard to georeferencing could potentially be um, addressed using AI to help 
test for locations or standardized by collector or perhaps date. So by using combinations of locations, collector and date, um, is it possible that that sp um, specimen actually, you know, came from that location given where that collector was collecting at that point in time? So there are ways to, um, again, improve data quality by um, doing some of these sorts of um, deep um, uh, inferences from the information that is in fact available with the record. Now, other areas that uh, really need attention these days are um, how best to cite the use of particular specimens and how do we make proper attribution? So when someone like myself and my colleagues, you know, when we use these specimen records that we've downloaded from, that are coming from herbaria from all around the world, how do we give credit back to those herbaria so that those herbaria can tell their um, those herbarium directors can tell their supervisors that in fact their specimens are valuable and are being used. So how do we make that attribution at the level of the collection, perhaps to the level of the collector and in other sorts of ways? So um, perhaps application of um, some AI methods could contribute to development of those um, appropriate citation and attribution methods. And then all in all, I think that um, the more we um, improve data quality, the more we put data out there and the more explicit we can be about the sources of those data, the better our science will be and uh, more reproducible. So again, I'd just like to come back to this point about the unanticipated uses of our natural history collections and the extreme value that they represent for us today, despite the fact that many of them are hundreds of years old. And um, also that these are important sources of um, very valuable biodiversity data to, for the future. So in summary, again, we have massive collections um, with unanticipated uses. There's an enormous utility of the plant collections that are available both online and as physical specimens. We can use the data to study response to climate change. We can estimate phylogenetic diversity and build that into our conservation plans. Machine learning has great potential across a number of different applications. Um, and these include things like phenology, but also identification, various sorts of um, functional traits measured from leaves and so on. And the specimens can provide us with material for phylogenomic analyses to test all sorts of um, hypotheses about plant evolution. And then finally, I think there are some um, great potential opportunities for AI um, to contribute to collections management and data quality. And all of this work that I described today was done in collaboration with some large and wonderful teams and um, it certainly um, reflects the work of, of these great groups of colleagues. And with that, I will be happy to take some questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Pam. I'd just like to remind everyone, um, if you have questions for, for Pam, to please post them in the Q&A uh, rather than the chat. And while we wait for uh, folks to post their questions, I've got one that we can start off with. So um, machine learning sort of strikes me in a similar way to next generation sequencing, where it's this whole new burgeoning field where, you know, even current PhD students at like I was a current PhD student at the time next gen came out and it was like, oh, here's this whole thing that seems great, but oh man, I got to learn everything about it. So machine learning and AI seems similar where it seems really, really promising, but, but you know, people, um, may not know anything about it. So for, for new students coming up or professionals in the field that think that sounds really promising, you know, where do they start? What, what should they do to sort of start taking advantage of this uh, in your uh, opinion? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks Brad. Yeah, actually, um, so my approach to just about everything is if something sounds interesting and I don't understand it, I find a collaborator. So the, you know, one of the best things I think any of us can do as um, biologists um, is to you know, work with specialists in other areas. So um, a lot of computer scientists are developing AI methods, but they're looking for a question. 
and they, you know, they don't have a biology background, but they understand that there can be some really great opportunities. So, um, so I, I said that kind of as a joke, but also I think very sincerely, it's, it's important to develop these sorts of partnerships because um, you know, our, our field is highly diverse. We can't, any of us actually be an expert on absolutely everything. So, um, you know, the best science is done by teams, I think, where we have people bringing different expertise. Well, and that said, you know, the, by having collaborators who are experts in various sorts of AI, um, th this means that it gives us the opportunity where we can actually start to learn more about it too. So, um, and then, you know, then you can actually develop some real collaboration where the computer scientists can start thinking, you know, may have some interesting ideas about application to biology and where we can be thinking about, oh, I wonder if this little thing got tweaked this way, you know, what, what that would bring to it. And certainly there are a lot of biologists who are doing um, great work without um, computer scientists. I was just speaking from my own inadequacies that that's the, sort of the approach that I need to take, so. Taylor, uh, it looks, uh, one of our um, organizers, it looks like she's crafting a question here. I don't know, Taylor, if you want to come on the mic and just go ahead and ask, or are you ready for me to read that off? Hi, Pam. Yeah, sure, I can ask it. Uh, can you guys hear me okay, though? Yeah, great. Okay, great. Uh, so it seems like machine learning currently is applied mainly to two-dimensional scan data, and I was wondering how long you thought before we may have the ability to use AI and machine learning to generate segmentations of three-dimensional structures, for example, bones of vertebrate skulls or internal organs? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, it, it is really interesting how um, rapidly some of these approaches are being developed um, in different groups for different questions. So I recently came across some um, work that uh, Kelly Diamond is doing. She's a, a postdoc in Seattle and she's interested in fishes actually and in some um, ecological um, sort of e e evolutionary ecology, I guess, uh, of fishes. and. Um, she's been applying machine learning approaches to um, 2D scans, but she's also now um, starting to um, develop methods for doing it with, um, with 3D reconstruction. So the 3D um, sorts of, of images that are being developed for a lot of, um, for vertebrates, she's, she's using that on um, some fishes and it looks really promising. So, um, so I think there are, um, there are people starting to develop some of these, um, these methods and extend them, extending them into, you know, the, the newest sorts of imaging that's are, that are arising. Thanks, Pam. Uh, and sorry about the dog barking in the background. No problem. We have one here too. <laughs> I was thinking, oh, I wonder if you can hear her. <laughs> Maybe a, a more general question here. Um, for people that are making new biological collections that they're gonna deposit in natural history museums, what, what kind of new data would you suggest uh, that people prioritize? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. That's actually something that we considered in, the, um, in that committee for the National Academies report. And so there is a section in there about generating um, new collections. And I'll just um, preface the, my answer to what your question actually was um, with another comment though first. And that is that, um, you know, not only do we need to be making new types of collections from new regions and new organisms and so on, we actually also need to be recollecting things that have been collected before. Because if, if all of our records for a certain region or a certain group of taxa go back to 1900 and we have nothing now, well, how do we possibly look at what the effects of climate change are if we don't actually have some more recent data points? So this seems like a really obvious thing to think about, but um, so many um, institutions, probably in large part because of um, diminishing resources, are not interested in collecting more of things that they already have, but it's exactly those sorts of collections that are needed for uh, you know, some of these applications with regard to global change. Um, so to actually answer your real question, um, 
there are a lot of um, there. Are, I think there are a lot of ways that we can um, modernize our collection approach. Of course, it means it's going to take more time. It's going to take more, um, you know, uh, it, the collections themselves will take more space. Um, the whole, you know, the whole operation will be um, much more um, intense. But it also means that we are likely to have a lot more information um, into the future. So in addition to sampling that voucher specimen, you know, there should be tissues that are collected and whatever that means for whatever group of organisms, you know, for, for plants, it's generally pretty easy. You put some leaves in silica, right? Um, but you might also be interested in getting material that would be useful for expression level changes in the future. So. Um, you know, you might want to collect some tissue that you can use for transcriptome analysis in the future. Um, and then you might want something having to do with the rhizosphere so that you have um, soil that you, where you can examine the, um, uh, the microbiome of the, of the surrounding soil. You might also want to collect um, leaves for metabolomic analysis and also um, other samples that could be used for uh, looking at leaf endophytes or something like that. And so even from a plant where, you know, you might not think of there being as many um, tissues, there are a lot of pieces that go into making up that extended specimen that are not um, uh, referred to right at the beginning of our session. And then of course, if you're working with, um, with vertebrates or um, or maybe other animals where you can um, have different organs and tissues and all of that. You'd want to preserve all of those things also in such a way that if there are parasites, um, then those could be um, eventually sampled as well. And again, I think the more we can think about the value of the specimen collection um, from an expended, extended specimen concept and also from unanticipated uses, if we could try to anticipate some of those uses, a little bit better, then our collections could be even more valuable. But that actually, you know, means that you might need to have a whole team of people collecting everything. And, you know, and we actually did um, uh, um, some sampling like this for a different type of project. It was sort of an um, evolutionary ecology project, but everywhere we went, we had ecologists and systematists and some microbial people. And we were, we ended up sampling along all of these different lines. Um, with, and so we ended up with these massive collections and, you know, it would be, you'd be lucky if you could, you know, get, you know, some relatively small number of things collected in a day, but the amount of information that we potentially have will be much greater than what we could have done in a normal um, collecting trip. So that, that's interesting that you say that. So to, to build off that, would you think that, you know, there's one approach that would be collect as many species of this group that you want at a superficial level or much fewer, but much more information. So it seems like that's such a big conflict uh, to, to think about and make that decision. That, yeah, I, I mean, and this is an where, yeah. So I think this is maybe where the, um, you know, where the science needs to help drive the collection. So, um, and, um, Actually, that's another point that we made in the um, in that report is that there needs to be support from the science, the, from the research projects to support the collections themselves. And so, as people are um, writing their grant proposals to do some sort of work that involves collecting, and oh yeah, I'm going to put my specimens in the you know in my local collection. Well, there need to be resources that accompany that. Um, particularly if one is interested in, ex you know, getting all of these pieces that represent the extended specimen, um, because that, that becomes incredibly expensive, obviously, for the um, collection housing all of those pieces. We've got one question from the audience here. Um, what do you think the challenges are of integrating data across large databases and across different taxa with different standards of preservation and specimen metadata? Uh, yeah, there are That's big challenges. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there are big challenges that, um, you know, I mean, I think people have been struggling with for quite some time. And if you think back, um, you know, maybe 15 years or so ago, it wasn't even exactly clear how to, or if it, it, it may have been clear conceptually, but it wasn't clear 
um, operationally, how to um, even combine data from one collection to another. So, you know, the herbarium at Michigan and the herbarium at Florida might not have been able to combine their data um, just because they weren't all using the same um, standards. So the fact that we've been able to make such huge progress in aggregating data um, along the, at least at the specimen record level, I think means that you know, a lot of these uh, really difficult problems can be solved. But that's just to get, you know, essentially one sort of data together. Um, being able to link up all of those pieces from the extended specimen is yet another real challenge. Um, because typically, if we think about how things are now, there might be a, um, some DNA sequences in GenBank. Hopefully, those are linked to a voucher specimen, not necessarily. And the voucher specimen format that GenBank has um, previously recommended, um, it does not actually provide a globally unique number. So if you um, try to actually, and we've, and we've tried this with, with IDIG Bio, um, if you try to actually match up all of the um, voucher specimen numbers in GenBank with actual specimen records, it's not, there's not um, a single way of doing that. There are multiple possible solutions. And I think we were able to add about 100,000 um, uh, sequences as um, into fields associated with specimen records, but this is out of you know many millions. So, um, and that's an example using data where we actually understand something about how the data are curated and where there are um, data curators at GenBank uh, working on, on these problems. So, so even just linking up the specimens with sequences that are already published um, is very, very difficult. Um, going forward, having clear plans about how to um, assign some sort of persistent identifier to each piece of that extended um, specimen. Um, if we could come up with a way of doing that, then eventually everything could be pulled back together by being related to that, that voucher specimen number in the center. So um, there, are, there are people in the US working on this problem, um, but there's a slightly different solution that's being developed um, in Europe um, through DISCO, which is the um, distributed science, distributed science, uh, something collection. Anyway, I'm missing a word, systematic, uh, sorry. Anyway, I used to know what that stood for, DISCO though. Um, and they are um, developing um, uh, something that they call the uh, digital, um, specimen object, which is, you know, conceptually very similar to the extended specimen, but, um, but they're, they're developing um, conceptually a slightly different way of um, linking those um, pieces together where there might be a registry or something. But there's, there's some good communication now that's taking place between these communities so that hopefully we will arrive at a single solution that will work for collections, um, you know, basically around the world. Thank you. But those we, are, anyway, those are a few of yeah. the like, really bad <laughs> problems. I mean, those are the, like the obvious ones and even those are, are pretty big. Why don't we move into the panel part of the presentation and invite Hernan to come back on. All right. Uh, Hernan, I don't know if you had any thoughts you wanted to share. So, yeah, so. actually, I, I couldn't agree more with, with everything that Pam has said. The, 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 the one thing I wanted, I was thinking about that, that it's interesting to add to that last question is that we can think of the, of, of the extended specimen concept both as something that we're building now with new collections, but also as something that, that to, at least to an extent, we can reconstruct going backwards in time and sort of elevate the value of older collections beyond the, the actual specimen that is cataloged in collections. And I think there's an incredible potential in there to recover historical information that for things like, for example, studying environmental change and things like that is invaluable, but it is not necessarily accessible, uh, which doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So things like, for example, field notes and, and, and things like standardized environmental data that is associated with specimens or sometimes not, but has data that 
nevertheless can be linked to collections or at least to the geographic coverage of collections that are contemporary is also a hugely important area for, for developing research. Um, we are, just as an example, trying to, 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 to do something like that, exploring mechanisms to, 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 to take advantage of this almost 100 year uh, historical set of environmental sampling of, of Michigan fishes that resides in, in cards that are typewritten, sometimes handwritten. And we're trying to, 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 to recover that information to, to, to track changes in, in fish environments because we actually have some of the specimens that are associated with those, with those cards, but the extent of the actual data is, is very sort of backbone type is the sort of thing that you would have in, in, the, in sort of the label of the bottle or, or the minimum amount of information that you need to catalog something. But that really has the, the, the potential to, to, to unveil a huge amount of data that otherwise wouldn't be accessible. And the other two things in that regard that are, that are promising, but not much more than that for now, unfortunately, one is, is using tissues of preserved specimens uh, to go backwards. In the case of herbaria, like Pam was saying, that, that has been done to, to a certain extent uh, extensively and the same thing with dry collections like mammals and things like that but with wet collections like fishes or amphibians and reptiles we have the problem that that those specimens for the most part are both preserved in formaldehyde and very old and therefore degraded so recovering dna from that is pretty difficult there's also an initiative that is being led by a few colleagues to try to use tissues for stable isotope analyses so that you can look at changes in nutrient uh, cycling and things like that over time in association with land use and things like that. So this, this sort of backward looking extended specimen concept to me is very intriguing. It'll, it'll, be, it'll be very challenging to incorporate that as a, as a, as a global component of our collections, but I think it, it has a huge promise as well in allowing us to, to fill in gaps beyond the specimens of, of historical importance. We've got a couple more from the audience here. Um, all the tech, one is um, how to get everybody on board, I guess. Uh, all of the technological tools that we come up with won't solve the data integration issue. So there will always be a social aspect of everyone um, playing the game. So any ideas on how we solve the social issue of ensuring that everyone does what's needed to make the necessary connections between disparate data elements? I think, yes, data elements. So which of us do you want to have to oh, that one first? You, go, go ahead, Pam. You can start there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's definitely a tricky one. And, you know, certainly um, it's something we've talked a lot about with uh, regard to the, um, the attribution and citation issue. Um, mm -hmm. They're both, and I'll just use that as an example, um, but it applies to everything, you know, that I think was um, mentioned and implied in that question. But from the um, attribution issue and citation, um, you know, it's definitely a technical issue, but it's also definitely a social issue. Um, but how do we solve social issues? So we can solve social issues um, with carrots and with sticks. And, you know, some really, I think, hard problems maybe require a bit of each. So I think the more, the more we understand, and in this case, I'm saying we as the, you know, as the data users, maybe the more data users understand the importance of providing appropriate attribution for the um, specimen records that were used, then, um, you know, the more likely they will be want, that they'll want to do it. And the fact that it's, you know, not very efficient to do that now would mean that there would be more people crying for development of the tools. And once the tools are available, then, you know, maybe we need to make sure that um, just like, you know, I remember when people didn't actually have to put their, um, their GenBank accession numbers in a paper or refer to them anywhere. Um, and, or, and so people didn't necessarily put their data, their sequences in GenBank. Well, of course there were decisions made that, well, of course we need that. And so journals started requiring that. And if you wanted to publish your paper, you had to do that. 
So why not the same thing with um, attribution of our specimens and uh, citing them in ways that um, allow for um, that tracking that would be useful for both for the managers and directors of collections as well as for uh, reproducible science. So who are the editors? Well, we are, we're the community. So we're the, we're the editors, we're the reviewers. If this is something that we think is important, then, you know, then we develop mechanisms. So at least our society led journals will be, will start requiring those things. And as more journals require than other ones will um, join in as well. So, so I kind of think that the social bit will take care of itself over time. And I, I mean, and I th feel the same way about the technical aspect of that, but it's, you know, we're not there yet. So, and I, I, I use that as an example because I, I think the, I think the history is clear of what can happen. Um, and so that leaves me optimistic, but, um, but maybe that's in, you know, conceptually easier problem than some of the other um, aspects of data integration. But definitely, I agree completely um, that, you know, we have both social and, and technical aspects to all of these problems. And maybe Hernan wants to comment as well. No, I agree completely. My only, my only thought, and I don't know if this is actually going to be the case, but it's like, I wonder if as the, as the sort of informatics structure of that allows this integration of, of, of extended specimens continues to evolve, it will also become easier to, to, to provide that attribution because it could be built in into the very systems that we use to recover and integrated data. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I think there's, there's a lot to be done in that direction. And, and, uh, I think Pam is absolutely right. It, it ultimately, it's up to us to make sure that it happens because we are in a position to, to make it happen in, in many different ways. Uh, but I think we're going in that direction. Uh, what's fundamental is to understand that our ability to access this vast amounts of data uh, doesn't come from nowhere, that it, that it has a huge cost to a very large number of, of, of of people in the community and that, and that it's important to, to recognize that. But, so we need to come up with better mechanisms to do that. Mm -hmm. That segues really nicely into a question and comment <clears throat> from a, a member of our panel here is that um, the Florida Museum, Pam, is considered often uh, sort of a, a leader. And I've definitely experienced this in, in museum informatics and sort of shaping the way that we can handle and push all this data around. But um, a lot of particularly smaller collections, but even the biggest collections have a problem sort of, or have had problems prioritizing how to build that uh, internally. So um, I don't know if you can make some comments about how you, since you're now one of the leaders, how did you build that up? And, and what was your, what would your advice be to collections that, that need help in, in building that? Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, and I think a lot of it involves history that um, definitely preceded my move to Florida. So um, there was active databasing taking place in all parts of the museum um, when you know when we arrived in two thousand one. Um, in the herbarium, for example, Kent Perkins had developed you know a really awesome system for. Um, databasing the plant specimens and similar things were happening in other parts of the museum. In fact, there was um, there was a staff person who had been hired to help develop databases for all of the um, all of the collections. And I'm not really sure what motivated that at that point in time. This must have been back in I don't know maybe the 70s or 80s. And so there there was a history of uh, wanting to put the information out there. And uh, well, to organize it first, and then eventually, as people started to be able to put their um, databases online, then you know, then there were attempts to do that. So, so part of it, I think, at any institution involves the history, and then through um, you know, through a number of hires that were made, um, people with increasing expertise in those areas, um, you know, just continued to contribute more and more to the, that um, overall approach. So 
uh, when Nico Salonis was hired and Reed Beeman, um, they both contributed so much conceptually to the development of um, you know, thinking about databasing things beyond the scope of one's individual collection, but linking all of our collections together in the museum, as well as linking out to other collections you know, elsewhere in the country and in the world. And then that ultimately led to um, uh, our hiring of uh, Rob Gralnick and you know he's he's revolutionized what um, the individual collections have been able to do um, in terms of you know just thinking about how they manage their data um, and from that to how we use the data so um, yeah so I mean it, it's definitely been a multi-decade investment in um, you know in, in the area and partly you know and how it started I really don't know it's an, an interesting question so um, I mean, I think I mean, one of the things that I think has been really beneficial is the development of community that emerges around being able to share your data and whether it's community with your colleagues who are working in different taxonomic groups, but who are facing the same sorts of issues or whether it's um, community on a much you know, broader scale. Um, I think it, it argues for the need for um, those um, sorts of technologically oriented positions to help um, tie us together. So it's kind of an interesting thing, I think, where I think we can, I think we can be um, better as a community if we have um, that help from technology holding us together. We've got a, a really good question, I, I think, from the, the audience here. Um, Museums play a fundamental role in the documentation and description of biodiversity, but taxonomy and systematics are rarely mentioned when we discuss emerging approaches to gather data from specimens. In addition, most of these approaches rely on destructive sampling. So what is your opinion on the role and place of taxonomy and sort of basic systematics in 21st century specimen based research, um, because I think often that's maybe considered old fashioned. Uh, so since that's at the base and everything else relies on it, how do we still, I, don't know, I think you understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, um, if our specimens are not named properly, um, you know, everything else, you know, everything can be garbage, you know, from that point on. So, um, so we, we definitely need that foundation of taxonomists and, um, you know, whether, whether we distinguish between taxonomy and systematics, you know, that kind of depends on one's um, philosophy and training and everything, but, um, but certainly that's, you know, that's foundational. Um, and work in monography, for example, and I would say, you know, I mean, we have the opportunity for revolutions in monography right now. And um, I'm not sure how many of, of you all have been participating in some of those um, discussions through the, um, um, the workshops that have been hosted by um, Felipe Zapata and Meg Daly, but, um, but those are showing, you know, um, a new view of data integration as a way of developing more, um, you know, more, robust um, monographs as well. But then those have the opportunity to, you know, go back and annotate all of those specimens and whether, you know, so the development of technology, I think, can continue to help um, lay, uh, lay that foundation of, of taxonomy. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's, it's really important that we um, not lose the organismal expertise that's required to, um, you know, to take care of our collections and um, not just in the physical care of them, but through, um, through annotations and understanding of, of what the specimens actually represent. So um, yeah, I think, I think we're often, I think that the questioner is right. We're, we're often you know, thinking about what's new, what's new, what's new, but um, it, we have to continue to appreciate that important foundation that taxonomy plays in all of this. So. Um, I would not want to, um, you know, to downplay that at all. Yeah, if I can add, I mean, I think one fundamental thing to keep in mind is that our knowledge and understanding of biodiversity is both very uneven and very incomplete. So um, I think we have an opportunity to, to marry uh, a continually increasing our knowledge and understanding of biodiversity by 
on the one hand, remembering that we need to think of biodiversity globally. Those of us who work in the tropics, for example, are constantly confronted with the fact that you go to certain parts of the tropics and in the case of fishes, at least, sometimes you go to places where most of the things that you're catching are, are, are probably new to science. And uh, so we're, we're losing a lot of information just by virtue of the fact that we don't know what's where in, in places like that. But at the same time, uh, I like to I like to think of, of 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 modern sort of biodiversity discovery in 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 in, in the terminology that I like to call targeted exploration, which is going to places that we know are poorly known in, in diversity and do it with this sort of modern approach to to collecting in which you maximize the amount of information and also distributing the impact of what you're doing by by doing it in a truly global sense, which is working with the people that, that live in, in places where biodiversity is incredibly rich and ensuring that to the extent that it's possible, we're, we're also training them and, and collaborating with them, which is, is a really productive way to, to do things, but it's difficult and it's, 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 it's challenging because it requires time, it requires resources, it requires very careful planning and sometimes all of those things are in very short supply. So it's very important when we can do those things to, to do it in the, in the way that is most productive. But it's also fundamental just in terms of what we need to do with biodiversity. For example, I was, I was watching uh, Pam's uh, analysis of phylogenetic diversity across, across Florida and I was thinking all along, like, there is no way we could do that pretty much anywhere in South America, for example, which is where I work the most, because we just don't have the data. We don't know what is there. So I, I personally do a lot of taxonomy, very old fashioned, never cited kind of taxonomy because otherwise we don't even know what units we, we need to be studying, let alone be able to do fancy phylogenies or understand what they're telling us about evolutionary processes or, or use them for prioritizing conservation and things like that. So. It's really important to, to bring up this knowledge of biodiversity from a global perspective with a very clear understanding that taxonomy is front and center to all of these things that we do. We, we can do a lot of things because we already know the taxonomy of some things, but we are missing the opportunity to do a lot of other things that are very important and very urgent in some cases because we don't even know where biodiversity is or, or, or how to actually identify it. So it's absolutely essential to keep doing basic taxonomic, systematic and field exploration work all over the planet. Mm -hmm. I think um, one of the things that occurred to me as you were speaking um, was also the value. And I think you referred to this um, um, briefly, I think, but I, I guess I'd like to make sure that um, that we state this maybe more explicitly is that mm -hmm. the value of um, traditional knowledge. Um, so mm -hmm. in areas where where there um, are indigenous peoples who have um, who know something about the organisms, you know, there's so Absolutely. much that we, that we can <clears throat> learn from them. So in fact, mm -hmm. our work on taxonomy could be expanded in this area by incorporating yeah. um, to a much greater extent um, mm -hmm. that traditional knowledge. That's, that's absolutely true. I, I had a very, uh, a very amusing experience in, in a very remote part of South America where we've been working for a few years. The first time we went there, we found this crazy amount of fish diversity that in some cases we couldn't even place at a family level, let alone know what we were looking at. It's absolutely incredible. But there was this one fish that we thought we completely nailed. We, we knew exactly what that thing was. And uh, one of our guides was from one of the, of the communities locally and she was hook and line fishing this fishes for food. She wasn't collecting for us or anything. And at one point I, I looked at the bucket and said, oh, you have that thing. And she looked at me confused and it's like, no, there's two things there. I mean, what do you mean? So they just look exactly the same. It's like, no, 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 this one it's crunchy and this one is soft wow. <laughs> and sure enough when we fed them when we ate them for dinner one was crunchy and the other one was soft turns out those are two totally different species we, we never noticed wow um, 
So, yeah. but yeah, I mean, that's a funny case, but you're absolutely mm -hmm. right. I think there, there's, there's a lot of, of understanding that, that we can take advantage of from a scientific perspective in, mm -hmm. in, in the local communities of wherever we work. Mm -hmm. Got another question here um, from Rich Rabler. Uh, an aspect that he sees as a data provider, he's a collection manager at the University of Michigan Herbarium as well, um, in case some of you don't know him, um, that is that there's a gap between how our data is being used by people that use it off of these data aggregators um, and what the providers are supplying. So do you have any thoughts on how we can bridge the gap between, you know, maybe meeting the needs of the users a little bit better or understanding what they're actually want from us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. And, and hi, Rich, glad to um, have the question. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And it gets, it gets back to this whole issue of, of communication. Um, you know, I think, there's, there's a continuum in terms of the amount of data that, um, you know, that is being provided. So that some collections, as we discussed earlier, you know, are barely struggling to, um, you know, are struggling to be able to provide just baseline data from their records, um, whereas others are able to provide much more um, in-depth information, linking to the field notes and, you know, all of these other sorts of, of information. Um, Ideally, you know, I think, um, you know, researchers in certain fields may be able, I mean, maybe they're getting most of what they need, but ideally there should be some conversation, um, you know, between the, the providers and the users. Um, and Rich, I'm sure you'll remember some of our early IDIG bio summits where, um, you know, there were some of us who were saying, we can't wait for the data, we can't wait for the data. And then, um, you know, and the, the providers are like, this is taking us a long time to get this sorted out. And, you know, we, we, were, we were trying to have those conversations, but um, in fact, it was maybe a little bit too early. So it's, that's maybe something that we ought to um, think about uh, revisiting. But I can imagine, I mean, if you think about what's in a, you know, a herbarium specimen record or, you know, like on a label or whatever, there's so much more information than what is typically provided in the, the digital record that you get from a download. So of course that varies a lot, but it would be, it would be great to be able to have the rest of that, you know, a lot of that other information digitized. So for example, you know, the, the phenological state, which could be, you know, might be noted in the um, text, but that text is in like notes and, you know, not something you can actually really mine the database for. And I imagine that sort of information is, um, you know, is true for, for many other sorts of organisms as well, where things end up being in the notes because there's not like a good place to put them otherwise. So, um, you know, prioritizing some of that information would be uh, really a really valuable discussion to have, I think. Maybe one in general for our um, early career scientists that may be watching this and wanting to incorporate um, specimens a little bit more in their research. So what, what advice would you to give to graduate students or, or you know, people that are gonna become graduate students who are interested in incorporating collections uh, into their research. Do you wanna take that one first? Um, I have to admit, I, I got a little distracted with the chat. <laughs> so I missed <laughs> oh. the question. So, so the question was- I'm embarrassed to admit oh, that. Sorry. That's okay. Um, so what advice would you give to soon to be graduate students or early graduate students who are interested in incorporating collections in their research if they're not, if the not in the place to just do that easily. Uh. Um, that's a really good question. I think, I think this is a, a wonderful moment to be able to incorporate collections and research because despite all the limitations and, 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 and still sort of growing pains that we've been talking about, I think collections are right now more accessible than they ever were, even, even in, in the state that we are. So, um, I think in that sense, trying to incorporate the data that is already available is, is a wonderful way to, to participate in collections. At the same time, I think it would be great 
to understand what's behind that data, to, to understand where it comes from and, and what it takes to get it where it is. Uh, I think I think it's easy to, to forget when, when you just go on the internet and get a bunch of data that, that, that that's coming from somewhere. And uh, I think the best best way for us to, to incorporate collections into our work is to actually contribute to collections. From collecting itself to understanding what goes in, in, into curating and maintaining collections to actually maybe even creating collections. One of the things that, that I think is really valuable is, is, is to grow the number of collections. And there are many places where we don't have collections that, that would be absolutely phenomenal to do it. So. Uh, it's it's not a it's not a simple or or, or necessarily easy uh, thing to do, but it would be incredibly valuable. But I, I think get in touch with collections. Think about how all this biodiversity information that we have out there can serve to expand and and, and improve the questions that we can ask of it. Because ultimately, we are a community of service to the broader scientific community, and and the value of the collections is increased by however it's used. So get in touch with curators, with collection managers, ask them if this is something that makes sense. Ask us, why don't we have this kind of information? And maybe we can figure out a way to get it and, uh, and be aware that collections are out there and support us, support them and contribute in, in whatever way you can. It sounds a little cheesy, I think, but, but I, I honestly think that's a, that's a good way to start. <laughs> yeah. I, no, I agree. I think, you know, getting involved and in, um, if possible, you know, if you're at an institution with a collection, um, right. then then that's that's a great way to um, get started. Um, I, I guess when, another thing that you might want to think about um, is the fact that there are a number of workshops and things that are offered um, through um, professional society meetings at various conferences and so on. And, um, you know, we typically do uh, um, you know sort of niche modeling phylogenetic diversity sort of workshop at our um, annual botany meeting and we you know in person we would cap it at like 50 or so um, we tried it online last year um, and there were like 160 people who signed up and thank heaven that not quite everybody attended because there weren't enough of us to actually help everybody but um, but there are definitely online options as well as um, in-person options that will be returning at some point. And um, those, those can be um, good ways to, you know, just kind of jump in. And, um, and there are some tutorials and things online too. So um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think one of the things that's happened during this past year is that things that were training programs that had been developed to be in person um, have been migrating into online tutorials and whether they're all available yet or not is another question, but they ought to be in the near future. So, um, so there may be some ways for, you know, self teaching of application of some of these methods as well. Well, yeah, I was going to yeah, go, go ahead. Here. No, go ahead. I was just going to add a little bit. Of, uh, Pan made me th think of something when she said, "If you are at an institution that has a collection, volunteer at the collection, or see if there's a work study or some other way to participate." Because the one thing that is never enough in collections are hands to do the things that we've been talking about through this symposium. Mm -hmm. Um, and any kind of work that one can do at the collection is help. It's also a phenomenal learn to wait to uh, a phenomenal way to learn about biodiversity. Um, you you can read all you want about the diversity of a place, but it's a very different thing to have a specimen in your hands and, and actually learn how to identify and, and, and why it's called what it's called and what it looks like. So, that might be a good place to stop um, unless we're getting close to the top of the hour here. Um, mm -hmm. Is there any other sort of closing remarks or should we wrap it up here? 
I just like to say thanks again to um, all of the organizers and um, our moderators. Um, this has been just really a great experience for me. I really enjoyed having this conversation and um, congratulations for putting together a whole um, series of, of talks on collections and how they're being used. So thanks like, for including me. Likewise, thank you very much for helping us. Yeah, thank you, Pam. And thanks to everybody uh, for attending and for accepting to speak at the symposium. It's been an incredible fun to, to have everybody together. So thank you very much on behalf of our museum and, and, and of everyone here in Michigan. With that, I think we'll call it a, a successful symposium and, and keep an eye out for what we're gonna do next year. <laughs>